I am Trey Balchowski, and I am here to welcome you to Odd Salon. I am one of the co-founders of this fine event, and there is someone missing tonight for the first time ever at Odd Salon. Annetta Black is not here. So for the purposes of recording, she is in Portugal having a blast with her sister and her brothers, and I would like you to all say hi, Annetta, so she can feel the love. Hi. Thank you. Uh, this is the very first Odd Salon in five years that she has missed. Ah, so let us begin. Welcome to Odd Salon. I am here to introduce tonight's curator, John Adams. He came to us very early in the evolution of this little beast and helped out a lot. And now we have a YouTube channel because he basically forced it on us. <laughs> So, we have a glorious YouTube channel that he puts together, and I'm very happy to have him on stage to curate Contraption. Hey, how are you all doing tonight? <laughs> Woo! Welcome to Odd Salon. Thank you for coming out uh, to our evening dedicated to contraptions. Uh, I'm John Adams. You normally find me over there manning that large video contraption, uh, but tonight uh, I'm up here speaking, and I'm also your curator of tonight's lineup. Uh, before we introduce our speakers, as we do, I'd like to ask how many are here for the first time? All right. Excellent, excellent. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What you can expect this evening is that we're going to have three talks. There'll be an intermission, a cocktail break, a small giveaway of which you can win one of our very cute Harveys. Woo! You can also buy them over at the merch booth. Um, but, and then we'll have three more talks after that. And you can hang out and have a drink afterwards. We hope you stay with us and ask some questions. And... Let's talk about our speakers. Our speakers by design are both experts and enthusiastic amateurs, so please, please be generous with your applause. Uh, tonight, we're gonna share six short stories inspired by the odd corners of history, science, art, and adventure. adventure. Hi, whoa, what happened there? There's, that's the slide I was looking for. Uh, and there'll be a cocktail break in the middle, so you can refresh your glass. And uh, one thing, this is not, is not a quiet event, so please make some noise. <laughs> and let our speakers know that they are loved. We also have some secret awesome Pee Wee Playhouse catchphrases. Regulars, please help me out. Yes! And? Yes! Excellent. This is our participatory, uh, participatory project by design. Our stage is your stage. If you have a story you want to share, if you want to speak, you go to oddsalon.com speak. At oddsalon.com, you can also find our mailing list so you can join us, know when the upcoming events are. Also, please do not put your phones away. Be as rude as you want. Make sure the other person can still see you. Okay. But get us on the usual places. Tweet, Instagram, Facebook, do it up. Uh, and finally, on Facebook, we have our conversation group called Something Weird. Go on to Something Weird, and there'll be more information from the speakers, like we put books in there, notes, links, all of our reference material, all up in there. Have a look at it. It's really cool. It's weird. Yes, excellent. And a fun way. Okay, tonight, contraption. Um, I want to say a few words uh, about contraptions, and we normally call this our invocation to kind of kick things off. Um, from six classical machines, as defined by Renaissance scientists, we found a way to combine and repurpose those elementary machines into complex structures. Levers, Levers pulleys, things. Um, we've moved from simple starting points to compound machines that we use in everyday life. We combine them all together in bits and pieces, and we make things that are sometimes interesting, sometimes useless. Machines, by their very definition, are useful things, but some machines that fail to live up to a standard of usability range from the useless to the absurd. It is these absurd and frequently overly complex machines that we call contraptions. Uh, we find these absurd machines... Science, arts... Are, oh. That's all right, you'll all get together eventually and say it on the same time, it's fine. It's all right, it's all right. Uh, so we find these absurd machines in all of these different corners of the world in the machinations of art, history, science, and literature. And within ourselves, yes, uh, we also find contraptions that build our bodies and our world, and these contraptions take many forms. We find them in wood, and we find them in metal, and we find them in art. Art? And we even find them in ourselves. And you see what I did there? DNA art, DNA. Cool, right? All right. It comes around. Science. Um, in, some, in some cases, these complicated machines may have seemingly no purpose. Like I'm sure when Babbage first made the analytical engine and 
this, this is his schematic for it, he didn't really understand where it would lead to. But in other cases, these complicated machines become a basis for future machines of great importance. And the, the wall between the machines that we build and the relationship between humans and machine blurs and changes continually. In Victorian times, the introduction of gearing and clockworks formed things called clockwork contraptions and later strange and fascinating automata. The Victorians and the time they lived in, the Enlightenment, desired a reason-based view of all things, a belief that you could represent anything using the precision of machines, that all could be understood just by using a clock. And they even extended this to their model of society, that they thought that the clock was a representation for a perfect society. But the, re the reality is, is that maybe they didn't have an understanding of what the future could actually hold. And it's the common desire to understand the world that drives science, that drives invention, and that allows people to build and discover new contraptions. And each inventor, each researcher, as they design and build contraptions, they get a deeper understanding of the world. Uh, with the automata, it provided us with models of people and animals which appeared to move independently, animated by forces that at the time weren't well understood. They were hidden mechanisms that drove these, these devices, but really they were more than toys. The engineering efforts required to drive the mechanics and to animate uh, a doll, um, that same work can be used to create something like the Jacquard loom, which was one of the first loom. It was one of the first uh, per, you know, pr programmable machines. You could put punch tape into this thing and out would come a blanket or what have you. Um, and also clockwork led to other great discoveries. And you know, one of my favorite stories is always the Harrison clock, which I spoke on before. But an obsession, these obsessions with precision and timing and gear pieces and things like that, it guides us across the world, it guided us across the seas, and it changes the way that we think about society and how society functions as a whole. The biologist Francois Jacob has pointed out that all of our explanatory systems, whether mythic, magic, or scientific, they share a common principle. And that common principle is to seek, in the words of the physicist uh, Jean Perrin, is to explain the complicated visible by something invisible. You know, it's almost like anything sufficiently advanced is magic, right? Um, and in biology, we've long sought to understand the way that nature's contraption works. You know, how do we go from a roughly a, a single spherical cell to a complex organism with limbs and organs? Uh, you know, we, we're all built out of modules. We kind of have the same pieces in different places, but somehow those pieces need to get to where they need to go. And the Victorians may not have been entirely wrong after all, because within ourselves is a complex contraption that we've only recently come to understand. And it uses time and switches and logic to determine our fate. And this, of course, is the science of Evo Devo. Um, and in evolutionary development, uh, it has shown us how this simple combination of switches and levers and gears actually create us. So through things like re repression, activation, other mechanisms, our body plan is dictated, and you know, we build the world that we live in. And every, every gene in your body has a code. You know, proteins may enhance or activate or veto things, and these proteins and genes form a complex system of logic that I think Rube Goldberg would have been really, really happy to see. Uh, you know, they signal each other, they throw switches, and each signal maps parts of the body to where it needs to go. And it's really, really interesting. And uh, this has only been, you know, in the last probably 10, 15 years we've been learning about this. You have uh, parts of your body like the homeobox or Hox genes, and they actually tell the pieces of the organism where to go, and they exist in all vertebrae. So here we have like this long nature, uh, natural contraption that's been there uh, since the Paleolithic times. Um, and even then, going back to clocks, uh, there's a thing called uh, heterochrony, where as an organism can change or can speed up or slow down the rate of the clock as they're developing, they can get more, more or less parts. So the snake kind of hacks this to get more and more and more vertebrae by just repeating that, that, that problem again and again. And it's, it's almost like he's figured out how to hack nature's contraption to make it work for himself. So that's, that's, that's pretty neat. Um, they have about 400 vertebrae, where like a mouse has 60, and we have even less. Um, so that being said, uh, the path from kind of simple cells to organisms is, is known, and it, it could possibly be the greatest contraption that we deal with uh, today. So mankind has always tried to recreate these sorts of things. And this, unfortunately, we, we did have a speaker tonight, uh, Patrick Ewing, uh, he couldn't make it, but he was gonna give a talk on uh, the digesting duck, and I think this is an absolutely insane contraption. It would eat oats and it would, it would poop. 
So you would feed it things, and then there would be this big chemical mechanism. And he claimed, the French inventor uh, Jacques uh, Vonkensen claimed that the mechanized fowl could move and quack and even digest food, which is pretty hilarious. Um, he said it was a chemical decomposition process, but mm, I, I don't think so. I think it was just a concealed mechanism and probably some, you know, extra poop somewhere. <laughs> so artificial or not, another great contraption we have in the world is that, you know, all this excrement that the fake organisms and the real organisms produce has to go somewhere. You know, the Romans actually made something called the Cloaca Maxima. You know, it was one of the largest sewers that took water in from the Alps and flushed it out the backside down into the river. Uh, well, here in San Francisco, interesting fact, a not yet famous but newly minted Berkeley engineer found work at the San Francisco City Engineer's Office. And he was mainly responsible for designing sewer, sewer system plans across most of the San Francisco area. He only got about 100 bucks a month, which at the time was pretty good for a, a new graduate. But he did learn something really important. And the job was so bad that it made him realize that for the rest of his life, he did not want to work for the city. Of course, the person I speak of is Rube Goldberg. And, and anyone who's seen the chaotic state of the San Francisco sewer water system will tell you his designs live on today. It wasn't until he began to mock his professor, Professor Frederick Slate, that his kind of rise to fame began. He studied engineering. He had this professor who was an instructor in analytical mechanics and the head of Berkeley's physics department at the time. And he kind of became the target for most of Rube's pointed humor. In his class, uh, Professor Slate introduced him to the mother of all inventions, and there was this terrible thing called a Bardwick, and it was designed, uh, according to him, to measure the weight of the world, and it was so big that it filled an entire laboratory. And I don't know about you, but I think the lever problem kind of wasn't going to work out there for him for measurement. Um, he used that imagery of that professor to create a new professor called Professor Butts, and he mocked and ridiculed this guy. And of course, he got kicked out of his class in the process. And this was a complete change of thought for Goldberg because he, uh, while he'd always been inspired by modern technology, he also sort of found out that people, uh, the way that people reacted to change was that they always wanted the more complex solution. And he found it strange that people would always sort of choose convoluted solutions over the simple. And for this reason, many of his cartoons poke fun at how people would overcomplicate their lives. And, you know, always keen to detail, he overcomplicated over himself by spending up to 30 hours on really simple cartoons, which is kind of crazy. Um, butts would make up crazy inventions like the self-operating napkin. And each machine, of course, would require a series of reactions from one part to another. In the end, creating a really simple function, but bordering on the trivial and frequently bordering on the ridiculous. And that was the true breakthrough for Rube Goldberg. Uh, as an engineer and a gag artist, you know, it could be said that his cartoons was just a concatenation of everything that he was. And as with all of his works, his characters remained to be larger than life and incredibly awkward. Butts launched Rube's career and he became a household name that we still use today to describe something that's probably an incredibly awkward but not well working machine that does something simple. And that's what happened when it entered the Merriam-Webster dictionary as a word that means doing something simple in a way that's very complicated and most likely not really necessary. So I'd like to raise the first class of this evening to the contraptions that hold our world together and to our never-ending hope that our contraptions will improve our understanding of the world. Cheers. All right, coming up. Stories of mad makers, ingenious inventors, marvelous machinery, and implements of wonder and infernal devices. We have for you this evening a well-calculated contraption of speakers. Please welcome me. Uh, please join me. I'm already here. Please join me. <laughs> please join me in welcoming, the, in welcoming our speakers. We have for you this evening Michael Bordhead. I, apparently, I can't spell either. <laughs> Avani Wadali. Uh, Eva Galprin. Bill Paul along with Alexander Rose and Lynn Rudder. And to kick us off this evening is Eva Galprin with Riding to the Devil. <laughs> <laughs> 